my fellow humans, welcome again to the Think Grow podcast, where personal development meets real life. I'm your host, Ruben Chavez, and normally I explore a variety of topics with thought leaders, creators, scientists, entrepreneurs, and all sorts of interesting people with the humble goal to bring you different perspectives you can use to enrich your mind and improve your life in whatever way you see fit. Today is a little bit different kind of episode. I'm going to be doing a Q&A, an Ask Me Anything. These are questions that were submitted to me through subscribers of the Thing Grow Prosper newsletter, which you can subscribe to, by the way, at thinggrowprosper.com if you are so inclined. I think it was about a couple weeks ago that we sent out an email to our subscribers asking if there's any topics they wanted to hear covered or any specific questions they had for me. And... I'm going to be addressing those today. So, and also my wife and business partner, Vanessa, will be joining me on this episode. We had a really fun time recording this this episode. Actually, we recorded it a few days after we got back from our Europe trip for our honeymoon, which was amazing, by the way. But when we recorded this episode, we were still very tired, very jet lagged. You might hear some of that in, in my voice, but... Um, It was a funny night, and actually I included a little clip of the comedy that occurred during the the evening we recorded this at the end of the podcast, so check that out if you want a little laugh. So you may have noticed that it's been about a month since we released a new podcast episode, and in part that's because I was on my honeymoon and I wanted to take a break. I decided to kind of just hold off on, on on working and producing any content or writing at all. I just wanted to be in the moment. But it's also partly because I have been kind of stepping back and reassessing and reevaluating the content that I produce on Think Grow Prosper, not just on the podcast, but on the blog and on my Instagram as well. N- not in a negative way, in just a contemplative way. And I think in part it has to do with the fact that I'd say for the past year, year and a half maybe, I have been going through what you might call somewhat of a brain and um, just been exploring new topics or topics that I knew a little bit about but really diving deeper into them. And um, just in doing so, it's caused me to think in different ways about the ideas that I put forth on Think, Grow, Prosper and look at these concepts and ideas through different lenses. Something that I love to study and I'm really fascinated by is the subject of philosophy and the most prized skill in philosophy is being able to think clearly and think well. And so learning how to think better has been something that I've been really focused on lately. And just looking at some of the ideas that maybe I once didn't question, looking at those through a more rigorous lens. That's all. And so that's part of what I've been doing. And the other part of it is that I just want to make sure that I am always producing useful content for you all. Um, That I'm putting forth ideas that are helpful and practical and actionable, or at least interesting. But also that I'm putting forth content that is a reflection of my current interests and where my head's at. Because on one hand, there's Think Grow Prosper, the personal development resource, the brand, you know, the company. And then on the other hand, there's Ruben Chavez, me, the individual, the ever-evolving human whose interests and intellectual pursuits change. And so I just want to make sure that I reconcile those properly and that I'm always saying the thing that's most truthful and and that's the most useful for you all while staying true to what I find interesting. And so I think that's a big reason why I started this podcast in in large part is, is to get out some of my ideas that didn't fit neatly into maybe the Think Grow Prosper brand on Instagram. And so 
Anyway, I've just been reflecting on, on all of that and organizing it all in my mind and just strategizing and making sure that I go about it in a way that I feel good about. So anyway, I know you didn't ask me for that explanation, but wanted to get that out, get that off my chest and um, tell you that it's all good. I've come to some really valuable conclusions, I think, during this time, and I'm really excited overall about the uh, direction that Thing Grow Prosper is headed and about some of the goals that I've set for myself recently. And, you know, I just, the thing that's most important to me is to put forth ideas that add value to people's lives. And, and I hope that I can continue to um, bring you perspectives that will enrich your mind and improve your life in whatever way you see fit. So, and, and I just wanted to say thank you all for, for sticking around and for being, you know, the reason for Think Grow Prosper is you all. And so I just want to thank you for giving me this platform on which I can share my ideas and explore topics that I find interesting. I am extremely appreciative of your support. So without further ado, I will let you get to listening to today's episode. Here you go. Today, I am here with my beautiful and intelligent and wonderful wife and business partner, Vanessa. Yes. We're going to answer some questions for you all that you have asked us. Yeah, you asked Ruben, um, but I'm happy to be here and tagging along. Well, you and you also helped me to fully develop my thoughts, and yeah, so that's true. That's, so it's that's very true. and you also add, add in things that I didn't think of, and so it's also I feel like I'm a counterpoint since we have pretty um, different approaches slash personalities. So that's true. What we do look at things differently. So okay, well I guess we'll just jump right into it. Let's. Okay, so this is Ask Me Anything number two. We actually did another Ask Me Anything. Yeah, the last time I was on the podcast. That's true, and that was the first episode of this entire podcast. That's what kicked off this podcast. Yes. All right. So, let's see. First question. Is it necessary to do something great and earn fame? Can't I just live a normal life and make my family and people around me happy? Okay, well, this is a fair question. This is a really good question, actually. This is this is something that I've thought about a good amount. It's truly a question of of success and what success means and defining it. I'm actually I'm working on a framework right now that that I'm I'm going to share with you all eventually. But it's a framework that's going to help uh, organize and make sense of a lot of different aspects of the field of personal development and different pieces of advice that you that you receive within the field but anyway one of the the parts of the framework is definitions and clarification and this is a matter of getting clear on what it is like not not only getting clear on on like what your kind of ideal situation looks like but also what your question is is really asking so like, is it necessary to do something great and earn fame? Well, necessary by whose standards? Also, what's great? Like, define great. And I would, I would really suggest writing this out, like actually journaling this and figuring out what it is great means to you. Um, also, fame. What is, what is fame exactly to you? Is, is this like a celebrity type of a fame or just like an internet kind of a fame or just like a micro fame? Like there's different kinds of fame, especially now with uh, the phenomenon of micro celebrity. So map that out. Um, I, wanted, I want to say that in general, you really have to find what it is that is meaningful to you. Like, it sounds like in this question, I think, I'm just intuiting here, that that you're kind of torn between the ideal version of let's say success that maybe you've been sold on on you know on TV on the internet on social media and something more authentic something more real something more genuine that you have in your mind and or in your heart and so 
th- those need to be reconciled somehow. But I think it's important to recognize that first, like clarify that, sort that out, realize that maybe there is this image of or this idea, this concept of success that you have in the back of your mind that that you're dealing with that's kind of not aligning with what it is that's meaningful to you. And so write write your thoughts about that out on paper and clarify that, sort them all out. Um, I, mean, I think that's that's a helpful exercise in general, getting clear on things. So those are my initial thoughts. What do you think? Well, I think it's a good question. And you're right. I do think that the question itself kind of implies that the reader is feeling like they should be doing something. And they're being pulled in two directions. Like, this is what I should be doing. This is what I shouldn't be doing. Um, And I think that that's a phenomenon that you and I talk about, which is the phenomenon of shitting on yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, how that can lead to a lot of discontentment. Um, And I'm saying the word should, S-H-O-U-L-D. And the idea of shitting on yourself is like, you're not enjoying whatever it is you're doing you're not satisfied with what it is you're doing because you think that you should be doing something else and so you this person for instance can be pursuing something great but they're kind of having this nagging feeling that they should be doing something else so identifying what you want and what you're we talked about this actually in the first ask me anything episode this is Mm -hmm. giving me deja vu about defining success for yourself success to you doesn't have to look like success to anybody else and how doing that exercise alone can reduce a lot of stress because this this question is like it's they're feeling a little bit stressed about the idea so and and just to answer your question directly yes you can just live a normal life and make your family and people around you happy that's a that's a noble goal but i would also caution you see this is another place where you have to get clear because what's a normal life right you may have an idea of what that means in your in your own mind but Again, map that out, define it, write it down. And then also making other people happy is a little bit problematic as a goal because – well, because you, you can't you can't determine. You don't have control over the outcome of other people's emotions, but you do have control over um, how you act. And so a goal that I think is a little bit more helpful or at least in the direction of where you want to go is something more like – I will act in a way that is in alignment with my values and presuming that your values are, you know, lead to behavior that enriches other people's lives, then you can control that acting in alignment with your predetermined values, let's say. That's something you have control over. And so just something to keep in mind. Okay, let's go to the next question. That was a good question. How do you deal with difficult people is the question. How do you deal with difficult people? I guess the first thing that comes to mind is, I mean, this is something that has helped me learning about personality types and learning about the different types of people that are out there, right? Because the more you understand something and the more you learn about something, the more tolerant you are of that thing, generally speaking. And so... Like something that I've been really into lately is the big five personality traits. That model is is really helpful. It's it's actually the most well-studied personality model, more than Myers-Briggs, more than Enneagrams, more than anything. It's the most well-researched and has the most data behind it. And so I'm not going to bore you with all the details of um, the big five model, although I don't think it's boring at all. Um, but I, I will say that it's there's there's five main traits, and just to give you an idea of of how it manifests in people, like it's basically a combination of these measurable, um, psychometrically valid traits that are out there that have been studied, and people are a combination of those traits. And so, if you have someone that's, um, let's say, difficult to deal with, as you're describing. They, they are very likely low in trait agreeableness, which is one of the traits. And so agreeableness is, is made up of two things. It's made up of politeness and it's made up of compassion. And so if you have someone who is low in politeness, for example, they're probably going to come off as disagreeable. But see, like just knowing this information is a helpful thing because, well, for me, 
it helps me to reframe it to not take it personally. Mm-hmm. And so now when I deal with someone who's, let's say, maybe a little bit blunt or rude or short or curt, um, you can reframe it as, oh, well, this person is low in trait politeness, right? It's more of like an observation rather than a personal attack. And so knowing that, knowing there's people out there like that, and that it's a valid way of being, just like your, you know, whatever your personality is, whatever aspect that defines of you, maybe you're high in trait politeness. Okay, well, that's valid too. And so knowing that you can you can better deal with people, and so how do you deal with that? Well, you know what you can better assess their value. Someone low in trait politeness might uh, value truth over feelings. And so they might be blunt. And and so use that information to kind of help you interact with people. I don't know. What are your thoughts? Oh, I agree. I think it is helpful to learn. It's interesting. I also find it beneficial to learn personality typing, but I find it interesting. The reason I find it interesting is because I like to get into myself even more. And so like knowing if we're dealing with that same person who's blunt, um, being aware of myself, like, Oh, maybe like, I know that I'm sensitive. Like that's something that I know about myself or I really, I'm highly compassionate. So I wouldn't be able to talk to somebody in that way. And so knowing that about myself, I can realize why I'm reacting in the way I'm acting. Um, and those that's just comes from having like a, a place of self-knowledge. Or just, you know, knowing where you are and knowing that other people, types of people exist. Like, you know, maybe they're a Taurus, you know, with a Scorpio rising and you're a Libra <laughs> with an Aquarius rising. Like you're different. And it's nice to remember that there are people who are different than us and different doesn't mean wrong or that they're not coming from a good place. Totally. Yeah, I think what you said is is perfectly on point. It's like you have to know yourself. Self-awareness is such a – it's a big concept and it's pervasive in personal development and in, in growth because it touches a lot of different aspects of your life. And so if you know yourself in relation to other people, then you can – better figure out how to interact with them. So that's also a really important point. And so and it touches on what you said, which is it allows you to take things less personally because it's like, oh, even if somebody's rude to me or if, if somebody's being difficult or disagreeable, like nothing my me being me doesn't lessen. That doesn't nothing nothing shifts because I'm the constant. Exactly. Okay, so next, next question. question. How do you read without getting overwhelmed? How do you read without getting overwhelmed? <laughs> okay, so this is something that I I do struggle with sometimes. Um, I love reading. I love learning. Not, and not just reading. Like I, I watch a lot of videos. I take a lot of courses. I, I um, listen to a lot of lectures. And so... It's a problem sometimes. You can get overwhelmed with information. You can get like cognitively backed up kind of. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things that I found to be helpful is to talk about the information that you're learning. Um, I mean, that's partly why I started this podcast. Like I wanted to unload some of that information and get it out there because when you talk about it, you get clear on your ideas and you kind of get it out there. It's like, you you um, unplug you unclog your your brain a little bit and I also talk with you right about the stuff that I've been learning that's something that I've committed to do more recently is to talk with you more about the things that I'm learning on a day to day basis so that I can kind of remove them from my mind a little bit. Um, okay. What thoughts do you have on that? Um, yeah, talking in general. Also, I think a big part of that is you get. When we teach information with the podcast, for for instance, when we teach information, we think about it in different ways. And of course, we are able to like sort it out or organize it in different ways. Um, But we're our brains are basically computers. So in the same way that your phone runs better when you turn it off um, and turn it back on so that it can wipe the RAM. 
forgive me for not knowing what exactly it is that happens with technology, but it's the same concept is, is that turning it off, resting. You do really well when you take breaks. Like yeah. even if we go on vacation, you don't read for, you know, with like a little three day weekend and you don't read and then you're, you come back and it's like you've strengthened your brain muscle and you remember our concepts better and you're able to like kind of go into it with fresh eyes. You can get back up. That's true. Like you really need to take breaks. That's that's a, a key to not getting overwhelmed. That's true. It's like when you go to the gym and you exercise one muscle, you wouldn't exercise one muscle every single day. You'd have to take breaks. Obviously, it's not the same um, physiological process of recovery in your brain, but your brain does need rest. And that's actually part of learning well and, you know, is to take proper cognitive breaks um, the other thing is only read what's germane to your life like only read what's relevant to your situation at the moment don't consume information that's going to be maybe useful in a couple of years or something and vanessa is smiling at me she's nodding knowingly we're, we're sitting in ruben's office and i'm looking at his like books on physics and like a stephen hawking book and um other like completely not germane items um so it's just a little funny <laughs> so yeah i'm not perfect at this and this is something that i still work on but um any way you can tie stuff to your normal to your current situation or your life and way you can use that information that would be helpful because it's not just floating around in your mind it's it's something that's actually being put to use and actually this ties in with the next question here, which is how do you retain information better? That's a really good question. This is something that I've been really fascinated by and into learning recently because this is like a meta skill. This is basically how do you learn, like learning how to learn. Right. Comprehension is a big deal. It doesn't matter how much you read. It matters how much you retain. And actually, uh, Jim Quick, the world-renowned memory expert is going to be on this podcast in the next episode or two. So really excited about that. Stay tuned. He has some really awesome tips and I've learned a lot from him in his podcast actually. Um, but I've also been reading a lot of other sources and um, learning from a lot of different, different uh, people. And what I found is that there are some principles to learning better. The first thing that I think is is really important is connect it to what you already know. Mm -hmm. So memory and, and learning in general is really built on connections. So it's like if you can consume an, some piece of information and connect it to your current body of knowledge, the likelihood that that's going to stick with you is much greater than if you just learn that in isolation and don't connect it to anything relevant or anything that you already know. So connect it to things you already know. Um, Another thing you want to do is when you, let's say you read something, you read a page of a book and there's some, some idea in there that really stands out at you. Just put the book down, then write about what you interpreted from that page. Um, or you li you're listening to an audio book or you listen to a lecture or something, pause it and then write in your own words what it is that you took away from that. Because translating that from, you know, the external stimuli to words in your brain, that's going to be a very helpful process, very helpful cognitively to sear that into your memory. And so that's recall. That short-term memory is like you're recalling that information. And what that does is that helps you to practice remembering so that later on down the road, when you're talking about that subject or that subject comes up, in another conversation, you can remember it because you've already practiced doing it. So that's a really good uh, good strategy. Any thoughts on that? Um, I couldn't agree more. I think that something that's interesting is that um, you're, you're kind of saying do homework. Like give yourself homework on what you're reading. Exactly. So from like remember what you liked in school. Do flashcards. Write a quick little essay. Write a summary. Like have a study group. Um, bring yeah. it up in conversation. I think something that I like to do that helps me retain information is like, even something that doesn't seem related is not germane to my life, making it um, relate to people. And so we had this when we, Ruben and I had, uh, we read the 48 Laws of Power together, um, AK, he taught me about it. And then what I would do is I would relate every law of power to a person I knew in my life or an instance I knew in my life. 
Um, sometimes it was me like, oh, I did that so well when this happened and related to, right, related to something that I could remember and, um, I personalized it. So I personalized the, the content of that book. Yeah. Personalizing information is a big deal. And also just use it. Like if you learn something, use it. And if you're reading stuff that's relevant to your life, then you're going to be in a position to use it. So using information and applying that information, you know, I'm assuming this is personal development or I'm assuming this is some kind of nonfiction that you're asking about. I mean, there's lessons in fiction too. There's stuff you can apply from fiction books too. Totally. So, but anyway, use it. That'll help you remember it. Okay. Next question is, how did you get into stoicism? What books do you recommend on this philosophy? Okay, well, I got into Stoicism through Marcus Aurelius's book, Meditations. And this was when Vanessa and I moved in together. When we first moved in together, we combined our books and, you know, put them in all in one, all in one bookshelf. On, I was looking at all of the books that she owned. And on her side, there was this really cool looking book. And it was Marcus Aurelius's Meditation, which, of course, is the personal journal of... A Roman emperor, a great Roman emperor, never intended for publication. So very fun, very interesting book that I found that I found really helpful and useful. And then, so that was my introduction. Um, I I went on to I've been, I'm a big fan of Tim Ferriss, and so I went on to listen to what Tim Ferriss had to say about Stoicism. That kind of that kind of made me more aware of the conversation about stoicism out there. So I got tuned into Ryan Holiday and his books, and and he weaves a lot of stoic philosophy into into his books as well. And so so yeah, the books that I love, um, Ryan Holiday's The Daily Stoic is a good one. That's just like one little tidbit per day for 366 days. So it's a really good uh, book for journaling. And and kind of ingraining those concepts into your mind. Um, also, actually, I think my favorite book is is called A Guide to the Good Life, The Ancient Art of Stoic Joy. And that's by William B. Irvine. That's a really good book because that's like academic enough where it's really thorough, but it's also written for a mainstream audience. And so it's um, it's really easy to read. It's also very practical. So it's it's very actionable and there's a lot of very like do this, don't do that kind of stuff. And the, the guy who wrote it's very clear and he's a very methodical kind of a thinker. So really, really good books. Any thoughts? Oh, no. I love, um, I love meditations. I think it's really easy to read. I really like the translation by Mark Forstater. That's why... I mean, that's why I had it, but he breaks it. He organizes it really well, and it's. I feel like it's bite-sized. I feel like stoicism, like any philosophy, can seem a little overwhelming when you're getting into it. Um, I think I bought that um, Meditations of Marcus really spoke when I was 11 or 12. So it was. it's totally digestible. And so that's 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 the way both of us got into it. So those are the two I would recommend. That, that's why I would recommend it. Yeah, that's a really good translation. I do like that. And he also does a really good job of the introduction and the background and the history of Stoicism too. So, Okay. People around me, especially the people I work with, tell me I'm not confident, this person asks. What do you have to say about confidence? What is it? What books can I read? What podcasts can I listen to? And what people do I need to study? Most importantly... What can I do to be more confident? And please don't say believe in yourself because I do. Fair question. So actually, I think you have some thoughts on this. And I really like your perspective on this. So, um, The way I feel about confidence is um, it goes back to the, an earlier question that we had, which is it's about getting to know yourself, right? So oftentimes confidence can mean or can feel like we're less than in a room of people who are more than or can be that we don't know exactly who we are. We don't know exactly what we bring to the table. So I feel like self-knowledge, knowing your personality types or knowing your strengths, like doing a, like knowing that you're, you have strengths in certain areas and um, weaknesses in others, knowing that 
can make you walk into a room and, and be confident, right? Because if you're comfortable with all of those facets of yourself, or at least aware, if you're aware, um, like, okay, I'll use my flub earlier from when I was trying to talk about computers. I don't know that much about how computers work. So if I walked into a conference and it was full of people whose job it is to know about the hardware of computers, I could feel really unconfident, but I wouldn't have to because I know that that's, that's not my strength. Like my strength is elsewhere. Like I can, I can do better in a, at a different conference. And there I would just be there to learn from people who do that all the time. We, we've actually been to a conference like many years ago, five years ago, where I felt unconfident because all of these people were, you know, really living the point of this conference and um, what we reflected on when we, or what I reflected on was that it was just like that, what, that, that's not me. I don't have to, even though I'm surrounded by a bunch of people who are studying something, I, there's still something to gain from being there and I can be uncomfortable because I don't know that much, but I can still be confident in who I am. Yeah, I, I completely agree. So, I mean, self-awareness, I think, is the central argument here. It's it's really the key to becoming more confident because confident confidence is, is kind of a this vague term and it's a really big concept, but it, it, it does boil down to, I think, just being comfortable with who you are mm-hmm. because that um, that feeling will permeate many different aspects of your life. Mm-hmm. And so the way you get comfortable with who you are is you study yourself and you figure yourself out, you sort yourself out yep. and you learn about yourself. Mm-hmm. Maybe you, you, you take a personality test. Maybe you take the big five personality test and you figure out what traits make you up and you fall in love with yourself a little bit more, you know, and then that leads to confidence. Like when you love yourself and you're comfortable with who you are and you accept your strengths and you accept your weaknesses and you know the places that you need to work on, like you don't have to be perfect in order to be confident. In, in fact, it, that's a liberating thought. So let's just pause there. Yeah. You don't have to be perfect to be confident. You actually um, just need to know, you need to know, have a map of yourself. Mm-hmm. If you were to go and try to get around a place that you've never been to before, you'd you'd be very unconfident. But if you have a map of that place, you'd be much more confident in how to get to where you're going. And so that's a useful way of looking at it. Yeah, actually, Esther Perel wrote something today. And what she wrote was something along the lines of self-esteem is being aware of your flaws and knowing you offer value anyway. Mm -hmm. that's a good one so it's like yeah i have other stuff going on yeah you just it's useful to know where your strengths um are and where they end and where other people's strengths are and and where they pick up from yours and so these these are things that contribute to, to confidence i think yeah also to the reader who asked the question i'm very sorry that somebody is telling you multiple people are telling you that you're unconfident all the time that is not going to help your confidence um yeah i mean i would i would take a good look at who you're hanging around and who these people are i think that's kind of the first the first (laughs) thing i I don't have the context but it's like figure out why these people are are saying this to you and 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 maybe have an honest conversation about like how that's making you feel like if it's if it's family members and they're presenting it to you in a constructive way that's that's one thing but it sounds like it's a little bit more disparaging and and it might be useful to have a conversation with with these people or one or more of these people and just kind of communicate how that's making you feel and the effect it's having on your life so okay you talked about overthinking in a recent podcast episode and you gave some strategies for overcoming it but I don't think overthinking is a bad thing. Wouldn't the opposite of overthinking be underthinking? Ooh. Can so, I just, I'm gonna, can I do a tiny little thing? Yeah. Well, the opposite of overthinking is probably like meditation, right? Um. Yeah, I mean, that, that could be. Well, the opposite. Right, right, so yeah. That makes sense. Like emptying your mind. Yeah, yeah. Not necessarily underthinking. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know. But. That makes sense. I, I like that. I, I never thought about that. So this is... 
I think that that's a good counterpoint, actually, the, the meditation, mm -hmm. because that's a productive form of non-thinking, mm -hmm. whereas overthinking is an unproductive form of thinking. Right. And so the way the way I like to define overthinking is the indicator for overthinking is when you are feeling anxious about the thoughts or if they're unproductive in the sense that they're repetitive and and causing you negative emotion. And so that's overthinking, but I want to separate that out from deep thinking because Actually, I remember when I posted about this on, on Instagram, there were some comments that were like, well, I, no, I don't overthink. I just – I think deeply and that's perfectly valid. That Thinking deeply, that doesn't involve um, – it doesn't necessarily involve overthinking. You can th think deeply about something and not overthink it and so thinking deeply is thinking conceptually. I think it's thinking philosophically. It is knowing about tools for better thinking and, and implementing those. You know, maybe things like thought experiments. This is kind of a philosophical tool and also a tool used in science sometimes to arrive at conclusions that would otherwise be kind of inconceivable. And so these are examples of deep thinking. And that is that is distinct from overthinking, which, I, which as I explained, is, is counterproductive. Deep thinking is productive, overthinking is counterproductive, and this is this is just semantics, and these are just you know words, but it's helpful to define them. Right, and it, I mean it's a spectrum too. Like you cannot think through something. I think underthinking exists, yeah. right? But it's I would there's there's a spectrum. If you go too far into deep thinking, you are maybe overthinking, um, and it's causing or it's negatively affecting you in some way. And then underthinking might be you're not thinking through something. Right. And maybe that lends itself to compulsivity or that, again, would affect you or your life in a negative way where you're not being as rational or as thoughtful as you need to be. But, like, there are those sweet spots of, mm -hmm. okay, there's meditation, the lack of thinking, and that can be very productive. There's thinking. There's deep thinking. So there are... You know, everything is a dichotomy. Yeah, and you really need to just find that balance, right? Like um, sometimes it's a appropriate to to not think and to meditate and to clear your mind. And sometimes it's appropriate to think. E Eckhart Tolle, he talks about this in The Power of Now. And he talks about it in a way that's, that's really useful, I think. Um, you should read that book if you haven't. But something that I really like that he says is that there are forms of intelligence out, you know, that exist that don't involve thinking. Like artists create from a place of no mind, he says, which I think is a really interesting concept. And and so that's just something to uh, to be aware of. Okay, are you able to give more advice on self worth and staying positive? I feel like I'm having a hard time with those, and it's driving me crazy. Okay. Well, self-worth, I, I think that does tie in. It, it overlaps a lot with with what we just talked about um, on, on confidence because and and so, so when you know yourself, when you know yourself, you can value yourself accordingly mm -hmm. and, or, and, and, and accurately too. Like when you actually have have taken inventory of your strengths, your skills, your personality traits, your good and the bad, and you have a a good idea of who you are, then I think you can love yourself more. The more you understand something, the more you the more you're inclined to love it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a big deal. Any thoughts on self worth? Um I think it's hard. I think it's I think it ebbs and flows and I think it can be hard. I think even I think knowing yourself is a really good tool and I think knowing your place in the world is a really good tool but I think that certainly doesn't make you um impervious to like cases of self-doubt or feeling negatively about yourself or you know having um times in which you are feeling sadder or more depressed or those kinds of things um happen and so and those like it's something that we a lot of us deal with so I think 
the two combined um, saying, oh, how do you help me with self-worth and how to stay positive makes me think that this reader is in like a hard place. And so knowing, not only knowing yourself, but also like being aware of your circumstances and being aware of like other things that might be leading you to feel this way, um, I think is, is a, another practice, like, eval- like doing an evaluation, like I, something I say, um, I tell people in my coaching practice is like, go where you're celebrated. Because it, it, it is really hard, right? It is It can be very hard to remember that you're worthy um, uh, and that you're, what you offer is enough. And so by, you know, seeking the roomy, there's that roomy quote, right? The seeking the people who fan your flames and um, who support you. If you are feeling in a place where you're not worthy or you're not feeling positive, like having a support system can really help with that. And it can be really hard to tackle alone. That's true. I I would also say that um, I would also question the assumption that you always need to be positive. That's actually it's not true. It's not realistic either, and it's un, it puts unnecessary pressure on yourself. There's benefits to not being positive. There's actually benefits to being negative or neutral sometimes. Like th- there are stoic techniques of like actually focus negative visualization, for instance, which we can get into, but. That doesn't mean you have to unpack and live there and stay there forever. But if if you have if you find yourself in a negative state of mind, it would be a useful time to write down your thoughts and clarify, sort out your thoughts about what brought you there, you know, and and um, and clarifying that and defining that in in really clear language will help you, I think, see the situation and figure out the way out oh, you know figure, figure the way figure out. out what you need to pay attention to figure right? out which you need to pay attention to so if you write down all of the things that are contributing to where you're at um it, that will help you better organize and set up or set up a strategy for um like what needs fixing if it's something new if it's something old is is it circumstantial like there are really like some sometimes life is really hard and so that's important. I would also, like, I, something I didn't mention, I mentioned the last Ask Me Anything, but, like, a lot of these questions echo, like, things that you have personally worked on, right? Things that, like, Ruben studies constantly, and he, as a self-development educator, is, um, uses himself as, like, or his own, like, things that he's t- had issues with or struggles he's had, and he uses them in, like, and studies the, kind of the behind the scenes. So what would you say like a strategy I know that you're I like I it was funny when you said that it's helpful sometimes to not to be positive but what about self-worth like do you have any like daily practices or strategies that you go to if you find yourself questioning that I I tend to be low in trait neuroticism this is a, 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 a trait of the big five personality traits and so that translates to me being a little bit more often um, not questioning my self worth, which is a good thing, but there are definitely ebbs and flows. And so, when I'm in a state when I'm maybe not not feeling myself as much as I, as much as I'd like to be, I, I mean, I, I really think you mentioned this earlier. Accepting that there are ebbs and flows mm-hmm. is, is in itself a helpful a helpful framework. Game changer. Yeah, and the reason is because. If you operate with the assumption that you always have to feel good about yourself, about the world, about whatever, that's a lot of pressure. And like life is rough. Yeah. And so it's okay. And sometimes even th- – there's been studies that social media is correlated with a, with a rise in mental illness, right? And I think part of that is – that you you you're always seeing the highlights of everybody's life and so you're you're seeing only what people want you to see and you think that you have to be on all the time your life has to be a highlight reel and and that's just not a realistic idea for your life so it's important to know that in real life there are ebbs and flows there's days when you feel positive there's days when you feel a little bit more negative um Figuring out what it is that that make, brings you more back to center. Mm-hmm. For me, that 
often actually is diet and regulating my blood sugar. So, I mean, that's just one thing. There's there's a variety of things that it could be, right? This is a multifaceted problem. Nothing exists in isolation, but like make sure you have a good solid breakfast, for example. Often that will help stabilize your blood sugar. Figure out what um, foods agree with you. And I figured out over the years, I've tested this, I figured out that if I have a high protein breakfast, I'll feel good for, you know, the whole day as long as I'm eating foods that agree with me. It's very hard to feel positive if you don't feel good physically. Mm -hmm. And so figuring that out is a, is a big is a big deal. Yeah. And that I think that goes back to assessing your circumstances. Like there's not just external circumstances like illness is a thing, chronic illness is a thing. Um who you're spending your time with, there's a lot of different factors. Um, but another way that I like is yes, seeking things out that normalize, um, sometimes taking like a social media fast or, um, unfollowing any account that makes you feel bad about yourself because they are a highlight reel. Um, and then refollowing later because you can feel less worthy if you're looking at these picture perfect magazine accounts of people who seem to have everything together that can make you feel less than, um, And then, yeah, I think it is really a freeing thought just knowing that you don't have to feel good all the time. Like if you're feeling really, really low, seek a friend, seek help. My best friend is a therapist. I've worked in the wellness um, community for a long time and I have found that just knowing that there's help out there is huge. Um, Being able to seek it out is also huge. And maybe it's just that you think it's like the first question, right? Where we're shooting on ourselves, like we should feel good all the time. And it's just, sometimes it's nice to know that Mercury's in retrograde and it's temporary and hopefully <laughs> that flow will happen again um, or what have you. Yeah. Okay, last question. You mentioned you were working on a book. When will it be done? Well, person who asked this question, <laughs> thank you for pulsing me accountable. That's what happens when you tell people what, what you're working on. <laughs> Yeah, I I have not been the most accountable on this project. I have gone off track various times and I've not been very diligent or consistent at least in my efforts for my book. But recently it came together conceptually for me at least. And I'm really excited about that. So there's a framework that I'm working on that that I think is... It's going to be really helpful. See, I didn't want to write a book. I didn't want to write a book just to write a book. Just because, like, it's cool to have a book or whatever. And for ego. And for ego. Like, I just I wanted to write a book that was actually useful. I also didn't want to write a book that was saying everything everyone else has already said. I, I want to put forth something useful and something different. The, the challenge, though, is in personal development there's really nothing new that needs to be said from a, like a wisdom standpoint. Like the principles are basically there, but I think organizing them is something different altogether. And that's kind of what I'm working on. It's, it's related to organizing information in a way that helps you to integrate it into your life in a, in a more useful way. And I'm really excited about it. I'm going to be posting some of the content that I'm working on in the coming months. But anyway, that's where we're at on the book. Um, I don't have any other news on the book. (laughs) Please don't ask me about the book. No, 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 no. no. Keep asking me about the book. I know I'm being weird about it, but keep asking me about the book. Um, I love that you guys care. I love that it's a topic of interest. And yeah, I need to be held accountable because it's easy to not do it. Yeah. And Ruben is... um... Probably like many of you, Ruben is um, quite hard on himself. And so when he said that he wasn't being diligent or he wasn't being, what did you say? Like consistent, consistent enough. Um, he is misleading you. Um, and he's actually been, you know, like studying and writing and doing book related things like 10 hours a day, but it's just not chapters in the same way. Um, and then I, I think when you said like, there's nothing new to be said, I think there is value not only in organizing, which the book is um, has, offers a really cool angle, but also in like simplifying 
um, really hard to access content or um, concepts. So making things that are lofty and inaccessible, kind of simpler and easier to understand through the way that we organize them or through the way that we, the lens that we think about it. It's kind of like a mindset shift about philosophy or things along those lines. Yeah, well, also my personal experience. I mean, there's there's definitely new things that need to be said from a personal standpoint, like how it relates to my life. And the reason why that's relevant is because other people who share similar life experiences can relate to it more, totally. right? And, and learn in that way. So yeah, I don't mean that there's literally nothing that needs to be said. Obviously, new books come out all the time and and there's relevant perspectives. So it's just about finding the angle that is that I'm excited about mm-hmm. and I think I've nailed it down or at least I'm in the right direction. Totally. So. Yeah. And in January, Ruben published this blog post and it was called um, 100 Things That Made My Year and it was about 2017. Um, and he, one of the things that makes me laugh every single time is this clip from The Good Place. Um, and it's Cheaty, if you're familiar with The Good Place, who is, but he studies moral philosophy. He's a moral philosophy professor. And he um, is like, what is he? He writes a book. And on page 1000, you start with, and on the other hand, the exact opposite might be true. That was like the first year of Ruben working on the book was just like 10,000 pages of really snuggling up with those concepts. Well, see, I've I've had a bit of a what you might call a brainessance. You the, you might call it a brainessance. Over this past uh this past, I don't know, year or so. Yeah. And what I mean by that is I've been addressing the areas of my life where I've had unconscious incompetence, meaning I didn't know that I didn't know these things, you know? And, and, and also areas where I've had conscious incompetence, meaning that I, I knew I didn't know. And just kind of rounding out and, and filling in the gaps in knowledge that I think is useful to help make me a better thinker and a better teacher for, for you all and, and for my own benefit. And so, so yeah, I, I have been, been doing that. That's, that's probably, del- that definitely has delayed the book, I think. But only in the short term, like long term, I think it's actually a, a good thing. You know, I've taken a step back, I think, this past year and looked at at the things that that I talk about on Think or Prosper from different perspectives, from a more philosophical standpoint, from a psychological standpoint, you know, and trying to kind of orient myself. And so it's been useful, and I think ultimately it's going to make for a, a richer book and. A book that has more depth to it. And so I'm excited. Or, or many books. Or many books. Or Ruben's many face. Books. It's just like, <laughs> no, let me write one book. It's happening. I'm excited about it. And as far as other projects we're working on, um, we will be launching the Mindset Shifts Masterclass again. Although I think we're going to be changing the name. So if you see a different name... Don't fret. It is it is the same thing. But I think this this month we're working on relaunching that. We're working with some with a whole group of um, Ruben is working mentees. as a, right. Ruben is um, working as a mindset mentor. Um, so that's been fun. Uh, I've been working on business coaching, and yeah, we have the anniversary relaunch of the um, we call it the master class I think it's going to be still have something to do with mindset but basically it's a course that comes out three times a year and it is an intensive course that really reframes um, how you think um, and helps you achieve mindset shifts it's something that I know in my coaching practice I have found it very helpful to apply it to clients and so helping them get to the mindset shifts that they need to reach goals that they've set for themselves or really just like let go of the limiting beliefs that are holding them back so yeah look forward to that in just a few weeks so Anyway, thanks for listening. Thanks for joining us on today's episode of the Think Grow Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, leave a review, and or share it with a friend. If you didn't like today's podcast episode, 
I'm not sure why you listened until the very end. Um, hopefully you'll like another episode. Okay, bye. I like your announcer voice. Thank you. Thank you guys for tuning in. We will... Catch you on the flip flop. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see ya. Is it necessary to do something great and earn fame? Okay, let me start over. Is it necessary to do something great and earn fame? That's not. Let me try it one more time. Can I say it? No, I got it. I remember I remember it. I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, Is it necessary? Please, please, please. Is it necessary to do something great and earn fame? Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Is it necessary? I'm saying, I keep saying earned. It's oh, earned. I've never heard, I didn't hear you say earned Okay, once. let me try it again. <laughs> I know you know it. Let me try it. <laughs> Think of like a, like an urn on a, on a, you know, on top of a fireplace. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks for listening. Um, okay. Should I read the questions? No. <laughs> Is it necessary to do something great? <laughs> Maybe we should do this tomorrow. Hey, thanks for listening to the Think Grow podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and find value in this podcast, I humbly ask you to please subscribe and or leave me a review on iTunes. Or you can just share it with a friend who you think might find value in it. If you've already done any of these, I want to take a moment to sincerely thank you. I truly, truly appreciate your support. Lastly, if you have any suggestions for future guests or topics you'd like to hear covered, you can email podcast at thinkgrowprosper.org. Thank you.